Hello, and welcome to The Secret Art of Managing Your Boss. This was originally a session at the 2006 conference of the National Association of Graduate Admissions Professionals, which took place uh, in April, late April of 2006 in Las Vegas. Uh, when I did this presentation there, uh, one of the audience members left before I began. She came up and talked to me and said that she was supposed to give a uh, synopsis of all the all the presentations that she attended uh, to her boss, and she wasn't really sure how she could um, represent this one to her boss. Now, that, that's a bummer. But if you're out there, mystery woman, uh, I hope this helps you. Uh, you'll be able to watch the whole presentation and hear me just as if I was standing in front of you. So with that, uh, let's get moving. I am Brendan Connolly. I serve as the Director of Graduate and Professional Studies Admissions at George Fox University, which is uh, located in near Portland, Oregon. And you probably wonder a little bit about my uh, qualifications in talking about how to manage your boss. Well, I've had a few bosses, and uh, it all started back in the day with mom and dad, where they gave me uh, chores to do. After mom and dad, I had a paper route. I had one boss there who was an okay guy. After that, I worked at Al's Family Diner, where I had a couple of bosses, Al and Irma. Al was a cool guy. He liked me. Irma didn't really like me, so Al had to fire me. Then Sports Chalet, rock climbing shop. I had one boss who was a, a good guy. I worked at Tim Fisher Roofing and Construction. I had one boss there. I worked there, there uh, in between college years. Uh, and, and Jim was a little bit mean. But he's still a friend today. Hi, Jim. And then San Diego Home and Garden Magazine. I was an intern and had three bosses in the nine months I was there. Service Plus, hardware store, a couple of bosses who smoked too much pot and store uh, went out of business. ESS Language School, probably more stories about uh, this boss who I worked for in South Korea uh, than any other boss I've had. Uh, Fred Meyer Stores, I had, as near as I can figure, about 15 bosses there in the uh, seven or eight years I spent there. Uh, mainly because of, uh, you know, corporate buyouts and, and whatnot. Uh, George Fox University, I've been here four years. I've had three bosses. And, of course, the uh, the big boss. I'm married. And uh, there's one boss there. So, to my, uh, to my count, I've had 28 bosses. And that's not as many bosses as I am years old, but it still seems like a lot of bosses. And probably a lot of you can relate to that. So here's where i got to come clean a little bit. You know, um, do we ever really manage the boss? Uh, you know, despite the title, the titillating title of this presentation, uh, I don't, I don't think we ever really manage the boss. Uh, in fact, this this title, the secret art of managing the boss, uh, is a little, little misleading. There's really no secrets. Sorry, uh, it's all pretty much common sense, but, but maybe arranged in a way that you haven't really thought of before. And then, uh, you know, the managed boss, well, it's the boss, and, and we don't really manage the boss's work output anyway. Uh, we, can, we can manage the relationship, and we can manage uh, the communication that we have with the boss. So in this realm of uh, managing the boss, I think there are three uh, big areas to be addressed. And those are you, the boss, and the relationship. And so as we go through uh, this presentation, I'll have some icons that uh, will help orient you to uh, whatever section, whichever of these three sections we're in at the time. Uh, the icons will be in the top left corner, and if you fall asleep and then and then wake up, you'll you'll know where you are in the presentation. This is the icon for you. Uh, three people, they'll be up there in the top left-hand corner. Uh, this is the icon for the boss, and uh, yeah, it looks just like my boss. Dale, there you are. Uh, and then the relationship. Now, this isn't going to be the icon, but this is uh, sometimes what we feel like, huh? I mean, sometimes I feel like the big head guy. Uh, sometimes I feel like the little head guy. But uh, although this represents uh, a kind of a reality with our relationship with our boss, I, I hope not not too frequent for most of us. Uh, it's not the picture I want to I want to portray. And, and this really isn't a picture either, though this is probably what we're aiming at, right? Uh, we would hope that the arms are attached to our bodies and aren't, aren't chopped off, but this is the kind of uh, mutual admiration society that we want to probably form with our boss. This is the icon that you'll see with respect to the relationship. I think sometimes talking to the boss is like uh, talking to aliens. So. Uh, this is the one that you can orient yourself when you see it in the top left-hand corner. Before we get 
too far along into those three things. I do want to uh, real quick go over a couple of tips, uh, just two, and those are starting with uh, talk no smack. Smack talk is just the idea that you speak uh, disparagingly about the boss when they're not around. You know, you want to talk disparagingly about the boss in front of their face, uh, you can do that at your own risk. But uh, there are, there are a, a couple of, um, I don't know, uh, problems with this <laughs> the smack talk. Um, first, you know, when your coworkers find out or start to realize that you aren't afraid to speak uh, poorly about someone when they're not around, uh, and, and they'll uh, start to lose a little respect, right? Their trust in you will begin to degrade a bit. Now, um, that's, that's if the boss never finds out, right? The, the best case scenario, I guess, the boss never finds out, you speak badly about him, your coworkers think less of you, yeah, whatever. You know, the second scenario is the boss does find out. Now, in, in this scenario, uh, there's, I, I, can, I can foresee three possibilities. One is that the boss um, is well-balanced, like me, I'm a well-balanced boss. And, uh, you know, you get to have this really uncomfortable conversation with the boss at some point uh, to, you know, discuss your concerns. So that's not fun. The, the other, another scenario, the worst case scenario, I guess, is that you are out on the street, right? You have an unbalanced boss and they fire you. More likely, uh, the boss just loses trust in you. Also, things kind of tighten up for you around the office. You don't get to uh, get the choice assignments anymore. Um, if your vacations don't get approved, that sort of thing. Uh, so avoid avoid the smack talk. The other thing to avoid is uh, leapfrogging. Avoid leapfrogging. This is the idea that um, you're talking, uh, you're kind of going over and around your boss, maybe talking to your boss's boss without your boss knowing it. So for the sake of simplicity, let's, let's uh, identify your boss's boss as the big boss. Uh, so this, this happens uh, more often than probably it ever really should, especially with, with email. Email is the worst with this sort of thing. Now, there are times when you can talk to the big boss, and it's perfectly acceptable. If, you, if you're pals with the big boss and you're talking about uh, the barbecue this weekend, no problem. Talk to him all you want. Uh, it has nothing to do with the office, and that's, that seems perfectly fine. But uh, let's say that you're pals with the big boss and you've got some gripes around the office. So you, you just run it by the big boss, get, a, get a, a feel for things, right? But you don't ever let your boss know how you're feeling about these things. Well, fine. The big boss gives you some advice. That's great. But then the next time the big boss is talking to your boss, you know, this may come up and suddenly your boss is kind of on the hot seat. Uh, I haven't heard about these things before. You know, why, why haven't they come to me with these concerns? So that's real uncomfortable, and then you get again. You get to have this uh, uncomfortable uh, discussion with your boss to to talk about your concerns, and and so just you know don't leapfrog. Okay, this brings us to you, and uh, a lot of what I've talked about here is is really about becoming uh, self-aware and mindful of your own uh, you know preferences and and uh, proclivities and predispositions. You know, you've got to love the alliteration, huh? Okay, so the first one here is perception. This is uh, something that is frequently understood in our heads. We know that we have, that, you know, perhaps we see reality through a different lens than uh, our coworkers or our bosses or our spouses. Uh, but, but we don't really know what that means. And, and to the degree that we can at least recognize uh, that we do all have various layers of fog on our windows on reality, uh, I think that's a good thing. And, and, and to be aware of that on a daily basis is, uh, is very helpful. This has been brought home to me even just this week when I sent out an email to some of my uh, direct reports and asked them to complete a certain task. And they, they, I, my intent was one thing and they read it completely a different way. And the, the thing I got back was, in no way met my expectations, but it, they fully thought they complied. So, uh, you know, it's perception is an important thing. So let's do this little exercise. I know you're probably sitting there all by yourself, uh, and you won't be able to get the full power of this. So I'll just I'll just race right through it. There's this sentence, right? Go ahead and read it a little bit. 
and I'll just be quiet while you read it. Okay, you got that? I'm going to make it go black now. Uh, now, I'm gonna, when I bring it back up, I want you to read it again and count the number of times the letter F, F as in Frank, occurs. I'll give you 30 seconds or so. Okay, got that? I'm going to make it go away again. And uh, if you were in a big room full of people, I would ask how many people saw uh, F, how many times, what the count was, and you'll, you would see a lot of hands going up for three, you'd see a whole lot of hands for four, some for five, a few for six, maybe somebody would catch seven. So let's uh, let's take a look at what the, the real deal is here. You probably caught these two, and you probably caught this one. That's three. A lot of people just catch these three, but there's also these other three here uh, on the letter of, and a whole lot of people. You'd be surprised. In a, in a, a room of a uh, hundred people, I tell you, two-thirds of the room don't catch these, and it's pretty freaky. So that's in a room full of uh, English speakers who can count to six, and uh, they can't do it. It's, uh, it's pretty disturbing. So that's the idea behind perception and uh, what you would, what you'd, I'd want you to be aware at least of, of uh, how you, you and other people can be looking at the exact same thing and see it entirely differently. Okay? I won't, I won't belabor that. Okay, now this know yourself idea, I don't want to get too metaphysical here, but um, this is important stuff. And, and a lot of this is, is simply self-knowledge. Uh, and there's this, what follows here isn't a, a comprehensive list, but it's a, it's a good start. This idea of work style isn't talking about uh, your pants so much. It's really talking about how you, um, how you structure your, your workspace and how you, how you prefer to work. I mean, are you somebody that loves to blast the ACDC while you're working? Uh, do you have piles of paper? You know, you're one of those people who, who say, uh, I know where everything is. Don't, don't worry about these piles. If you ask me for anything, I'll find them. Um, I'm, I'm sad to admit that uh, if left to my natural tendencies, that's, that's how I am. And it's not true, by the way. I can't find anything. So getting a sense and being uh, aware, on the, uh, you know, top of mind awareness of how you work is uh, is helpful and it's helpful in a, in a, a couple of ways I guess that we'll get to in a, in a little bit um, there's this idea that Peter Drucker if you haven't heard of Peter Drucker uh, he was a uh, he died last year earlier last year this year I can't remember which and he was a uh, renowned management thinker theorist uh, writer guru however you want to classify him he was a smart guy and he had uh, this thought years ago that all managers are either listeners or readers. Now, this, of course, doesn't apply just to managers. It applies to all of us. And uh, his idea was that we prefer to either uh, hear information first. You know, if, you, if there's a problem or a question, concern, we prefer to hear that and, and kind of talk about it a little bit uh, before writing it down and, and coming to a solution. Or we prefer to... Uh, read it first and, and mull it over silently, perhaps, before starting to talk about it with other people. Understanding your preference uh, here is key because, uh, as you'll see later on, uh, this interfaces pretty tightly with uh, how your boss responds or, or your boss's preferences with respect to being a listener or a reader. I'll, a, a quick story, when I was working in uh, financial aid, I had a staff of six folks, five of whom were uh, listeners, and I'm a reader. And it was, uh, it, it took a little while, but we finally figured this out, and um, I, you know, I, then I began to know why I was disturbed when people would just pop up in my doorway with a question, and I, you know, I would always send them away. Good question. Send me an email. You know, eventually they started to send me more emails, and I started to be more tolerant of people popping up in my doorway, and we each gave a little bit, but uh, uh, it was frustrating until we started to realize how we were. Okay, this idea of adapting. This is a funky one, right? I mean, uh, what I'm talking about here is, I'll, I'll address it in, in a little more detail uh, uh, later on, but this, this idea is that you want to adapt to your boss's style of working. 
but it's also helpful to adapt your own style of working and communicating to a better interface with, with, with theirs. And some folks may say, well, what do you mean? I mean, this, I'm supposed to change who I am? Well, that's not the idea at all. Um, and, and it's not, I don't see it as being uh, necessarily inauthentic. If you think about how uh, you work with your colleagues, how you, how you talk to them, compare that to how you talk to your college friends. And then compare that again to how you speak with uh, grandparents or grandparents or, or uh, your Sunday school teacher or, or some uh, person who you respect who you don't necessarily work with. They're vastly different. You, you approach it in different ways. Um, some of us even go so far as to wear different clothes for, for the, the occasions when we might meet these folks. So it's not that you're being inauthentic here. It, you're, you're being appropriate to the situation. Um, so the ability to adapt uh, in even small ways to your boss's working style is, is a good idea. So just, just uh, a note to be aware of your ability and willingness to uh, adapt. Now, this is uh, probably sounds a little bit strange, but this idea of how you view authority is also important to keep, um, keep in your uh, awareness sphere. Uh, take a look backwards and see how you've responded to various bosses. Certainly over time you have, you're a different person than you were when you uh, dealt with some of those bosses. But, but take a look at how you responded to um, their demands of you, their requests of, on you, of, on your time, uh, and on your patience, and uh, learn from that stuff and, 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 and begin to uh, apply it forward. And think about who really struck a chord with you and, and who were maybe more uh, bad notes, okay? Leadership styles, there are uh, a lot of I mean, there's books on this kind of stuff. There's a lot of identified leadership styles, and I'm not going to go through them here, uh, other than to say that uh, you need to consider uh, which of those resonate most deeply with your own work style. There are uh, a few here that I'll, I'll just run through. There's collaborative leaders who uh, tend to, to uh, pull folks together and, and uh, are concerned with mining the wisdom of the crowd, so to speak. Um, there are paternal leaders who are a little more uh, parental in their... Uh, concern and, and their discipline styles. Uh, command and control leaders who who have a difficult time maybe giving up uh, control of situations um, who are more comfortable um, giving direction than uh, seeking input. Uh, matrix or, or project-based uh, situations where there is no, perhaps there's no clear leader, a little more ambiguous. Uh, it's a cross-functional team, maybe with some dotted dotted lines for reporting structures. So just just some thoughts to get you um, started thinking about different uh, areas of, that you may encounter uh, types of leaders. Now here's something I want to talk a little bit uh, more about and uh, this is an important piece here, this idea of, of your strengths. There's been a lot of talk lately, at least in uh, uh, management circles, about um, uh, playing to people's strengths. Marcus Buckingham and, and, and I think Donald Clifton had a, a book called Now Discover Your Strengths, which is uh, excellent. And if you haven't read the book, uh, I encourage you to do so. It, uh, there's, there's actually a code in the book that lets you take a test online. It helps you discover uh, all of your strengths. And what's, what's particularly helpful, if you have the ability uh, to influence this in any way in your workplace, uh, have everybody take the test. Get a, everybody on a matrix and uh, start to see whose strengths lie where. And then you can begin to um, to reorganize a little bit and help people find work that uh, really plays to their strengths. It's helpful stuff. It's helpful to know particularly about your own strengths and, and uh, know what you're really good at. Um, you may have a, a sense of that already. Uh, but, but having this new language for it is, is pretty helpful in, in terms of viewing yourself through this, this new lens. Um, I've had a few strengths that um, were identified through this, this process. Mine fell into two categories, which were called uh, thinking and impacting. And my um, thinking strengths are described as uh, uh, the way that uh, I process information and, and, and perception. And then uh, 
my strengths in, in those in that category are, are called input, intellection, uh, learner, and connectedness, and they all have their own individual individual uh, definitions. Then impacting strengths are are uh, interpersonal strengths, and I have uh, one there. I have all these thinking ones where I live in my head, and then I have this one uh, impacting strength, which is called positivity, which is uh, I think essentially contagious enthusiasm, which is, is true. I, when I get excited about something, uh, I like to evangelize it a little bit. So there are strengths. I would encourage you to check out the book and uh, get to know about yours. won't say much about weaknesses here other than to say it's worth taking a clear-eyed look at your weak spots. It's a difficult process to do, uh, and I think it requires a degree of courage to con confront reality sometimes. Uh, and, and I guess the best thing about knowing your weak spots is that it helps you figure out better where your strengths might be applied. So that's just, that's uh, I guess all I really want to talk about with those. Good to good to know. Uh, it helps um, it helps highlight your strengths a little bit uh, a little bit more. All right. <clears throat> Each of these sessions will have a few power tips. Uh, and for the you section, here are a few. One is called the yay me file. If you've never heard of this, it's real simple. You, uh, you want to get a container. Manila folder will do the trick. And you uh, use this to capture uh, physical pieces of information. Spreadsheets, uh, sticky notes, uh, handwritten notes about something. Maybe you are a graphic designer and you made this huge banner. And it was the best banner ever and uh, it won't fit in your manila folder. Just write a note about the banner, uh, make a note about where it can be found, how long it took, you know, what all the great things were about it, and just drop it in the gamey file. Uh, if you've done some remarkable earth-shattering uh, spreadsheet work, uh, you could drop the spreadsheet in there. You want to make sure you have a, a reference point to where it resides on, on a server or on your hard drive, and a little, a little context about why that spreadsheet was so great. Now, this yay me file serves two purposes. The one is really self-serving, and it is simply a, a little personal motivator. It helps you uh, when you're when you're feeling kind of lousy, like you can't do anything right. <laughs> you can pull out the yay me file, and uh, you remember that you know you're doing okay, and that you're smart, and, and that you're clever, and uh, you do good things. <laughs> okay, a little personal uh, pump me up file. The second. Uh, it's a little more pragmatic. If your institution uh, subscribes to the idea of uh, performance appraisals, then the YAMI file is very helpful. Here's what you want to do. It, a lot of performance appraisals have two parts, one for the boss to fill out, one for you to fill out, a self-appraisal piece. If you have this self-appraisal piece, fill it out, make a copy of it, and then make a copy of your entire, a copy of the self-appraisal self for yourself and then make a copy of the entire YAMI file. Keep the original stuff from the YAMI file and put the copy with the original self-appraisal piece. You following me here? So your boss, a couple of weeks before uh, your uh, performance appraisal appointment, gets this stack from you with your self-appraisal. Uh, the stack is all these great things that it, you've done uh, in the last year. Powerful stuff. Your your boss, uh, if they're anything like me as a boss, they will uh, remember like the last two weeks, and and you know that's if they're lucky. Uh, I of course have gotten better over time, and I keep uh, limited versions of yay me files for my direct reports. Uh, but this is uh, this is good stuff. It helps your boss remember that you're awesome, and that you can do no wrong. And it helps you, to some small degree, uh, make your performance appraisal process be a little more of a happy time. OK, dependability, not so much of a hack as the gamey file, but it is uh, worth mentioning. Uh, the boss has got to know that they can depend on you in a pinch. You can be an utter goofball most of the time. But uh, when it comes down to the wire, you need to be able to uh, pull off uh, whatever it is needs to be pulled off, right? You need to be able to, to be dependable, and uh, that is pure gold to a boss. Uh, the turbo tip for this, in my point of view as a boss, is that you don't even have to do whatever it is you're being asked well. 
uh, at least not all the time. If you can get get the thing done on time, even if it's not uh, uh, you know 100%, getting it done on time is is fantastic. Now you know check with your boss first. This is just my personal preference. I'd rather get something on time that's not quite complete uh, and and allow for folks to finish it up later than to get something. Uh, fully complete but late so you know your mileage may vary with that but uh, check with your boss critical thinking I don't know honestly how to uh, teach this aside from saying that it's just the it's kind of the ability to think about your own thinking and and this is an important thing to the boss this a really simple and, and probably overused example of, of this idea is when you uh, you know you use your penetrating insight to discover some flaw in a in a work process, and you go to the boss and you you tell them all about it, and then that's it. You know, um, what's better than that, of course, is you use your penetrating insight to, to discover the flaw, and you go to the boss to tell them all about it. But you also have one, two, or three potential solutions for the flaw. Now that's good stuff. That's that's a little more uh, in line with critical thinking. So, um, you know that that example is specific to the boss and helping the boss solve the problem. Sure, but the uh, the big idea is that you um, look at your own thinking and are able to self-analyze a bit. That's really broad, but critical thinking as a skill is uh, a very important thing. Periodicals and regular reviews. I am a, a bit of a fan for a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen. At the end of this presentation, there will be some uh, uh, a list of resources for you. And um, that particular book is not in there, although it probably should be. Uh, so if you're listening now, you can write it down. Getting Things Done by David Allen. Excellent book. And some of this stuff here, this periodic goals and regular reviews, is part of it. The periodic goals can be part of um, your regular performance appraisal. You have these big goals that you set once a year. These periodic goals can be quarterly, monthly, uh, you know, semi-annually, whatever. But uh, they're they're uh, derivatives of the big goals that you've set during the year. And you can break those down into smaller goals and, and then you get smaller tasks that get you down the path towards those goals. The regular review is really, really the powerful sauce here. It's uh, the idea that you do a full sweep of all those outstanding projects, tasks, um, things that are bouncing around in your head. You, you review that, you kind of sweep it up and put everything in its place on a regular basis uh, on, on a time that you have pre-planned and are ready for, set aside specifically for that kind of work. Uh, weekly is probably the best on a Monday or a Friday. Um, just kind of get get your your house in order. But if you can't uh, stand it weekly, then it maybe every other week is fine too. But just the idea of uh, keeping things tidied up on a regular basis is a good thing. Okay, so the next big thing is the boss. What's important to the boss? Uh, there, there's a saying that where we spend our money and our time uh, kind of lets people know what's important to us. And we can apply this uh, understanding a little bit to what's important with the boss. Now, we are, I, I, I have no idea who you are, uh, and this is a uh, university focused <laughs> uh, presentation. So, um, and, and, and specifically admission. So, there are some things that may be. Uh, important to your boss, you know, enrollments, for instance, budgets and finance. You know, a lot of bosses are pretty concerned with that. Strategy, perhaps, um, HR stuff. Um, how how are you going to know what's important to your boss? Well, one one easy way is just to simply ask. This is maybe often overlooked. You can certainly observe. That's the cheapest way and and least intrusive. Uh, paying a lot of attention to, uh, you know, what your boss works on frankly. But if you can't really tell, if, if they keep uh, keep it pretty opaque, then um, my encouragement to you is to uh, set up a, a brief meeting. Let them know uh, that you'd like to find out how, you know, the way you phrase it, of course, is you, you say you want to find out how your particular job um, meshes with the goals they have for your department. Good stuff. Every boss wants to talk about that kind of stuff. 
So you set a meeting to, to, to uh, check that out. You want to see how you contribute to the overall strategy and how you can uh, better help your boss meet their goals, that sort of thing. A uh, quick tip for that, send an email in advance. Don't just pop up, irrespective of whether your boss is a reader or a listener. Send them a quick note. Uh, let them know what you're up to. And uh, I think you will get a much more positive response that way. Good luck to you with that. You want to um, pay attention to how your boss communicates and uh, not just your boss's uh, unconscious uh, facial tics. <laughs> you, you want to take a look at uh, these, this, these preferred channels, so to speak. That is, in what ways does your boss pass along information? And does that vary by category? Uh, you may never have noticed this, but 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 uh, but take a look, check it out, see if, if this is uh, if there's any truth here. Some bosses um, hang on to some stuff, uh, finance stuff, for instance, and, and human resources stuff. Um, but maybe they'll pass along a piece of a budget, but they only do it via email, right? Or maybe they only do it by voicemail and tell you what what they're after. Uh, so when they're talking about budget stuff, they only do it through one particular channel. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe they uh, use one channel uh, regardless of what the communication message is. So pay attention to, to those kinds of things. Uh, you know, they might want to talk about marketing by email, but uh, only talk to you on the phone when uh, there's a question about uh, registrar enrollment stuff. Okay. Uh, adapt. Again, here we are. Same as uh, the you section. And uh, you know, I, I mentioned this uh, a, 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 a while back when we talked about how uh, you might adapt to the boss's um, style of, of uh, communicating. The way it works here, you know, let's say the boss prefers to send budgets via email, right? Um, you will shoot yourself in the foot if you print the if you print the spreadsheet out, mark it up with four different colors, and put it back in their inbox, their physical inbox. Uh, unless your boss has asked you <laughs> to respond with spreadsheets that way, uh, they will probably be underwhelmed by your response. So respond in kind, adapt. If they send you a spreadsheet by email, uh, if you have to print it out to make sense of it yourself, go for it. But, but make your changes uh, digitally and pass the result back via email. Here we are again with uh, the Drucker thing. I mentioned this before. Uh, if you recall, I related my little story about my time in financial aid where um, there is a little bit of a disconnect there. Voicemail or email, this is similar to the listener or reader. Pay attention to what kinds of messages get the most consistent response from your boss. Uh, and I have here just voicemail or email, but it, you know, it may be a written memo, it may be a uh, uh, surprise attack in the hallway, you know, whatever it is. Pay attention to um, what what is your your uh, most uh, effective method of getting a response? Meetings. How does a boss deal with meetings? How do they run meetings? Uh, what do they do with the information afterwards? Uh, how you know how do they distribute uh, meeting meeting information? Uh, how do they deal with uh, agendas, uh, time setting, all that kind of stuff? Pay attention to. Uh, how your boss deals with that sort of thing. Uh, this VQs, uh, verbal, vocal, and visual cues that your boss gives. Now these are those, you know, I mentioned the unconscious uh, facial tics that your boss might have. Um, and, it, you know, it's a bit of a joke, but, but kind of not also. I mean, maybe your boss always pats their head when they're about to give bad news. Who knows? Uh, there could be some crazy stuff. But pay attention to it. And as you become aware of uh, how your boss transmits these um, unspoken cues, you can better time your own message. I mean, for instance, if, you're if your boss, uh, when they're mad, pats their head, uh, that suddenly you know that that's not the time to tell them uh, that you want to take a vacation, right? So uh, pay attention to those kinds of, uh, those kinds of visual cues. And, and, and I should mention, not just visual, visual, but also the vocal cues as well. So I won't belabor it. Time management. How does um, your boss manage their time? And 
uh, with whom do they spend time? Uh, are they, uh, you know, are they a daytimer person? Are they a, a, a Palm pilot? Are they just totally scatterbrained? They need an assistant to help them kind of manage where their meetings are and, and what kind of stuff they're doing. Are they always uh, running a little bit late? Like, you know, you have a boss buffer of 10 minutes uh, before the meeting starts. You start your, t your meeting 10 minutes earlier so that your boss can show up right on time, something like that. Pay attention. Uh, and I say pay attention again here. Be sensitive to um, what's going on. No doubt your boss has a lot of stuff on their plate. Uh, they've got a lot of constituencies, a lot of folks to serve, and time is in generally uh, short supply. So when you can uh, get a better understanding of those slack bubbles in your boss's schedule, uh, that's, that's helpful. That's helpful to your timing when you have to deliver messages. Uh, and I'm not saying that you withhold information. I'm saying simply that you be strategic about when you uh, deliver information. Uh, another no-brainer here, be careful with the interruptions as you get a better sense of uh, your boss's place in their world of work and, and where they're at, uh, the kind of the cycles and the ebb and flow of their, their day, uh, you'll, you'll be better positioned to, uh, to nail them with some of the, the stuff you've got. Uh, who's your boss have a standing meeting with? Uh, how long are they for? Standing meetings, of course, are not referring to people standing up, literally, but just meetings that are ongoing, uh, recurring meetings. Um, so with whom, how long, uh, about what, that sort of thing. Power tip here for the boss. This is an uh, easy one, and we've mentioned it before. Um, send them a note. Even if, you're, even if you have uh, just an easy little issue, squirt over a, a quick email um, you know, 10 minutes before and let them know that you're on their way. Uh, it just gives them a quick heads up, lets them kind of shift their thinking and be ready for you. And that uh, that five minute meeting really will take five minutes instead of, um, you know, stretching out into 10 as your boss struggles to um, catch up with you. If it's a big issue, give them a day or two and uh, let, them, let them wrestle with it before you drop by. Uh, work style. Your boss's work style. We talked about your work style before, but uh, how about your boss? Are they one of those uh, piles of paper people, or are they just a neat freak with a clean desk? Uh, you know, do they uh, need the music on all the time? Do they uh, are they are they comfortable with with massive interruptions? You know, BlackBerry buzzing, the cell phone ringing, um, email blinking at them. You know, that would that would drive me crazy, but but uh, some folks are good at it. Delegation. Delegation is a funny thing. Uh, I won't get into my personal uh, preferences with respect to delegation, but but pay attention to your boss and uh, what they what they hang on to and what they pass around. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, some some things are, are kind of kept close to the vest, so to speak, with your boss. Other stuff is, is passed around. I will say uh, that you might think about um, checking with your boss as to what their perspe perspective is on delegation and how they differentiate between delegation and um, direction. Uh, uh, I, uh, my personal perspective is that uh, the, if uh, the boss has something on their particular job description, uh, or, or something close to it, it's their responsibility, then uh, that's what delegation is. They're giving, they're asking someone else to do work that belongs to them. Perfectly acceptable to do. There's lots of good reasons to do that, but the, uh, the key is that uh, if that's the case, maybe your boss is okay with you saying no to a delegated item. Best, best to check in with them and see what their, uh, their perception is. Okay, micromanagers and under managers. Uh, micromanagers, everybody knows what a micromanager is. They, they can't let go of things um, they want to control. And under managers don't provide enough structure. So take a look at your boss. Which are they, do, they, do they tend one way or the other? Uh, personally, I tend toward under management. I have to fight that tendency all the time. Uh, it's it's uh, harder f for me to provide structure, but I'm, I'm, uh, I, get, I get better at it. I am conscious of it. Uh, under managers, oh, sorry, micromanagers often 
are this way because they have maybe risen up through the ranks, they've done something so well that they've been promoted out of that into a management position. Uh, management, by definition, is pretty chaotic, and you're, it's uh, not always easy to tell if you're making progress, and uh, there are a lot of pressures. And in those situations, some folks will uh, just fall back on what is easy and familiar to them, their old job, maybe your job. So if you have a manager who likes to hover and tell you how to do your job, uh, you know, tell you how to do stuff that you already know, maybe even know better than them, uh, the best approach is, is a tough one, but, and it's best done uh, gently. But you need to, you need to uh, on a, on a uh, you know, 35,000 foot level, you need to assure them that you're competent and you need to guide them away from that tactical stuff back into, uh, you know, process level stuff that, that managers should be uh, focused on. So uh, how do you do it? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on your personality and your boss's personality, but that's, that's the, uh, the big idea for you, um, kind of redirect their attention, assure them that um, you are competent. If they, you know, there's lots of tricks. I mean, you can sh maybe show them something that you know they don't know. Um, that might help assure them that you know what's going on. Um, also, over-communicating with a, a micromanager can, can sometimes be helpful if you are, uh, you know, you're kind of preemptive, uh, telling them stuff you know they're going to come to you for, so you catch them before they can catch you that kind of stuff. Over time, uh, if you're lucky, their micromanagement tendencies will go away as their trust in you grows. Um, if not, you know, it's, it's a hard thing, but maybe it's, maybe you need to look around or wait till the new boss cycles through. Anyway, uh, under management, uh, they can tend to be uncommunicative uh, and with respect to their expectations. They, uh, a lot of under managers like to think that they're just giving their folks lots of room to uh, achieve success in their own way, whatever that, whatever that is. But a lot of folks, uh, most folks really, need at least some kind, uh, some skeleton of structure as to how they can measure their success. Uh, it just it, it it helps it helps us get through the day uh, rather than just sitting there not knowing if you're doing. Uh, well or poorly, right? So, uh, with the the under managers, uh, since since they don't want to provide a lot of structure, uh, one good tactic is to uh, make sure you have a uh, this kind of three step feedback loop with them. You you ask them or or confirm with them what their expectation of you is you receive their response and you feed back to them um, your understanding of their response. Or it works the other, the other way around. Um, they tell you something, you feed back to them your understanding of that, and then you elicit a um, response back from them, you know, affirmative or negative. But you want to make sure that you do pull that out of them just to make sure that they did hear you. So there's a couple of uh, different approaches. Again, there have been books written on this stuff, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on the over under the under managers or the micro managers. There are, broadly speaking, there are five responsibilities of managers. Um, and when you, as, as you become better aware of these, uh, you will have a better sense of, you know, what your boss is up to and, and all about. So the first one is to meet the needs of the organization and the employees. This is not always as easy as it seems. Uh, these two needs are often at odds. For instance, uh, you know, the HR folks need to balance uh, the amount of money available uh, from the organization with the employees' needs to have good insurance, right? It doesn't always work out. Um, so there is a constant sense of tension uh, in the way that boss is able to meet the needs of both the employees and, and the organization. The boss needs to ensure that problems are solved, plain and simple. There's not much more you can say about that. The boss needs to ensure that expectations are clear. These are This is one of those things you can uh, pull into your uh, three-step feedback um, uh, process that, that we talked about a moment ago. The boss needs to, whoops, did I skip one? Um, needs to provide feedback 
uh, about uh, those expectations and, and how uh, how you're doing uh, with your job performance, that sort of thing. And the boss needs to manage process. And this is a strategic perspective, not a tactical perspective on uh, on the work. Okay. Whew. That was a lot of talking. Here we are with the uh, the relationship. Now, we will kind of slam this out. There's not a lot left that we haven't already covered between um, the you section and the uh, the boss section. Um, so here we go. You want to, uh, with respect to the relationship, you want to broaden the scope of your perspective on the boss's relationship. Uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier on, on you know where the boss spends their time with their standing meet meetings and that sort of thing. Take a look to, to the best of your ability, um, even beyond the workplace. You know what are the boss's uh, um, activities? Where are they spending their time away from work, and with whom? And uh, you know what is where they're spending their time can be a good indicator of what is important, and you can often leverage that to your benefit. Uh, the power of conversations. I learned this idea from a book called um, Critical Conversations. No, that's not it. Uh, Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott. And uh, the idea here is that she views all, all relationships as extended conversations and that uh, conversations one at a time can uh, bolster or degrade or uh, hold static our relationships with with one another. So, to the extent that you have meaningful and powerful conversations with your boss, your relationship with your boss will be bolstered by those. Uh, and the converse is true. Uh, and if you don't communicate at all, or just talk, you know, say hi, how's the weather, you know, um, you're not really doing anything for the relationship. There's this idea of. Um, you know, Covey calls it uh, the emotional bank account. I, I think of it as a goodwill account. This idea that you know, when somebody does does good by you, uh, then you know you owe them something, or or vice versa. Now that's fine. Everybody does this to some degree. We recognize, and you start to feel good about a person when they do a lot of good for you, uh, and almost like you owe them something. Okay, that's that's pretty natural. Um, what I encourage you to do is to avoid literally counting those deeds and and trying to make them balance. Um, it, it's just a time waster, and it it doesn't really uh, it won't it, it it won't take you anywhere. Uh, I gave this talk to a small group uh, at one at one point, and uh, someone in the audience asked me if um, before I got to the part about not doing it, she asked me if I thought uh, it would be beneficial for her to record all these uh, good deeds that other people paid her or she paid other people in a spreadsheet. And I think that's probably not a very good idea. So uh, don't get caught in this accounting trap. Um, my almost Pollyanna-ish uh, advice for you is to just serve, just focus on serve and how you serve others and how you serve your customers and and think less about uh, what that service brings you. Cool? Okay. Power tips. There's just a few here. The one-on-one. -on -one. Do a weekly one-on-one -on -one with your boss. If your boss isn't doing this with you, uh, you can you can make it happen. You can schedule it. That's and that's okay to do. Uh, don't make it particularly formal. It, and and in fact, don't do it at all if you know that your boss is, is showing up uh, at your office or in your cube uh, on a weekly basis, and that you guys are having a chance to even informally just kind of debrief and catch up with one another. If you never see your boss and you never talk about work on a weekly basis, even for five minutes, um, set it up and drive the conversation towards what is happening with you, what's on your desk, what, what uh, you're responsible for. Uh, and, and find out also what's on the boss's mind with respect to you. What are they thinking about this week? Okay, Five minutes, easy stuff. Now, same idea, 30 minutes a quarter. Um, schedule these performance reviews that um, you know last no more than 30 minutes. 
it's it's uh, an an easy thing to schedule on on your um, scheduling software. You know, if you use Outlook or Entourage or or whatever you use, uh, just get the bosses buy in. Let them know ahead of time um, why you're coming in and and what you're going to talk about. The focus should be on your progression towards your goals rather than the daily grind. Okay, if those one on ones are kind of the daily grind. These thirty minutes a quarter are uh, on the the larger goals. All right. Address your style. Now, this is something that you can uh, you can do uh, with your boss, also with your coworkers. This idea of, of being aware of your work style, one of the first things we talked about in this presentation. Um, know it well enough that you can address it with others and that you can help people work around you or you can know yourself so well that you can work around yourself. Uh, the better you, you're, you do at this, the less your coworkers will be scratching their head about... Uh, what you're what you're doing okay if you like the stuff in this uh, presentation uh, here are some resources that you might dig um, there's a book three books here mastery fierce conversations and, and career intensity mastery is a, a little book it'll take you you know a weekend to read if that probably a night if you're a fast reader it's, it's a great little book and it's really about uh, managing the plateaus you know when you get good at something and then you stop getting good and you plateau and you get frustrated uh, mastery is all about that stuff it's a it's, a, it's an older book uh, but it's well worth picking up fierce conversations I mentioned this a moment ago with respect to the conversation thing you know where you conversa relationships are extended conversation Susan Scott uh, this is has written a this a great book it's worth picking up career intensity uh, another excellent brand new book printed this year um, by David Lorenzo, also worth picking up. It's a, maybe a little more aimed at entry level uh, manager types, but there are nuggets of wisdom that everybody will benefit from, and it's it's a broad, it's a sweeping book. It, it has uh, a lot of a lot of information about uh, you know your personal uh, mastery kind of stuff to. Uh, how to interact with your boss and coworkers, all all that sort of thing. It's well worth picking up. Other books that I did that are not here, but that I uh, I mentioned are uh, now discover your strengths and uh, 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 the David Allen book, getting things done. Okay. Online there are uh, a few resources here. Forty three folders dot com is a uh, Mac centric site for. Um, uh, productivity tips. Slacker Manager is a, a blog. It's actually my blog. Uh, I put up uh, business-oriented stuff, some productivity stuff, some just general management musings. Then ManagerTools.com is uh, a little misleading. It is is pointed at managers, no doubt, but the uh, the the quality of information that that these two guys put out is outstanding. You, you won't you won't believe that it's free. It, uh, they primarily do podcasts, uh, which you can listen to on your computer or uh, on your uh, MP3 player. Excellent, excellent content there. Software uh, and the for the Windows crowd, there's Active Words. You can find it activewords.com. Uh, I won't get into all the stuff, all the magic that Active Words can do. Um, but if you go to selectormanager.com and you search on Active Words, you will find a lot of stuff about all the magic that Active Words can do. Quicksilver is for the Mac. It's a lot like Active Words, not identical. There's a lot of cool other kind of magic. Um, if you go to 43 folders, you will find a whole lot about Quicksilver, a little bit less at selectormanager.com. Um, but it is a excellent resource if you were a Mac person. Mind Manager is a mind map um, application. It's for Windows. There are uh, other similar applications. Mind Manager, in my in my from my point of view, is uh, cream of the crop. It's also expensive. Uh, there are some. There are also some uh, free uh, resources. One is called Free Mind which is an open source project for mind mapping. Uh, however you do it, mind mapping is an excellent uh, way to kind of organize all the stuff that's in your head. And there are lots of resources on the web and, and books about uh, mind mapping. So mind, man mind manager is a great tool. In fact, wherever you found this particular presentation, you should also find a, mind, a PDF of a mind map 
uh, about this presentation, which kind of helps uh, visually see how it was organized. Okay, that's it. Thanks for putting up with me. Uh, again, I'm Brendan Connolly, and uh, this has been The Secret Art of Managing Your Boss.